right, welcome back um, for this, this last afternoon slot. And my name is still Christoph Sauerwein. I'm still the CEO and director of ICAD. Um, and and it's, it's a great uh, privilege, an innovative privilege for me today to, to welcome uh, two women who are playing a central role in their workplace to promote and develop what we would rather call well-being, mental well-being, maybe rather than uh, mental health. I'm a clinician, so it was important for me to explore all that. And, um, and so we decided this year at ICAD to start to engage a conversation with significant organizations who have put on their priority to look at their staff as human being. Now, it sounds innovative, but the future lies there. So ICAD, at the origin, was a more clinical conference, but we realized that there is no point staying in our consulting room, hospital, and looking at the world with the word pathology. There's other ways to, to look at that, right? And, and so we started to seek about corporations who had a, a philosophy and a policy around the human uh, well-being, holistically, body, mind, soul, and amongst all that, uh, Providence helped me, and I came across K Forsyth, who is here today, um, and Liz Hamps, and uh, we started that conversation. And I discovered that um, a lot of things are happening not in my clinical room, it's also happening um, in the workplace. Um, a lot of people putting a lot of energy and effort trying to build um, well-being, trying to address it with, with model or with organic approach. So we decided that I can, that it is time to be state of the art, to give a voice to the workplace because there's a lot to learn there. And um, uh, you'll probably develop a little bit more uh, about Deloitte, but we're speaking of a quarter million organization worldwide. We're not speaking um, of a small company. Uh, so things are heavy to change, but things are possible also to be changed maybe at, at planetary level. Um, so I'm very, very um, proud and honored to have you with us today, Liz and Kay. A word about you. Um, Kay is a, uh, a partner in, in Deloitte Northwest Europe, and I also noticed you're an archaeologist, and we never discussed <laughs> about that, but we'll, we'll maybe we'll have one day, one day sometimes about that. Um, within Deloitte, I think the best way to put it is that you sponsor uh, the firm-wide approach to supporting the well-being and resilience of colleagues across all aspects of physical, mental, and emotional health. Um, I'm quoting you here. Um, and um, and I, I can witness for that, because this is, this is what we, we discussed so many times. Uh, Elizabeth, Hamson, Liz, um, you're most of a specialist, director in the strategy consulting practice at Deloitte, specializing in patient access to healthcare innovation. Seems like your colleague. Uh, and um, uh, you also have an extensive experience of developing mental health policy and advising on innovative and digital service delivery. You regularly, you're regularly asked to speak on mental health in different uh, places, UK, abroad, workplace, institutional, international organization. And I think I have to mention it, you also have an MSc in health economics and policy from London School of Economics. So the title, my friends, Thriving at Work, The Case for Investment, and Deloitte's Approach to Well-Being. I think with that, I can leave it to you. Thank you so much. Well, good afternoon, and thank you all for having the stamina to, to, <laughs> to stick with it to the end of the afternoon and coming and listening to us talking to you on what is, as Christoph said, actually probably quite a new area of conversation for the ICAD conference. And we actually feel very honored and privileged to be able to come and talk to this event. And in fact, for us, it's, we think there's a two-way conversation here, because although hopefully we might be able to share something of the journey that we're on, uh, equally, we know from um, the challenges and issues that our colleagues face into in the workplace, that there's a lot of the topics 
concerns and areas of focus that you bring to the table from the ICAD community that actually bring something to our workplace as well. And oftentimes those are some of the subjects that we find it the hardest to give people access and information and education about in a workplace for all sorts of, for all sorts of reasons, actually. So we, we think this is very much a kind of a two-way journey. Um, we'll do some introductions and, and give you just a little bit more of a sense of, of, of why, why us, why here, why now. Um, what we wanted to do this afternoon was, was obviously to give you that sense of who we are, talk just very briefly about Deloitte as well. A bit about the journey, and for us, this is very, we're a work in progress. We're a work in progress on this agenda as an organisation. Um, we're a work in progress ourselves in terms of our own journeys with the topic matter. Uh, so by no means fully formed experts and, and very conscious that there are a lot of people, a lot more um, in the topics that we're, that, that we're talking to, to here around us today. Uh, so conscious that we're definitely not the experts in the room on, on some of this material. Um, Liz is going to talk about the work she's done on Thriving at Work in particular and the investment case around paying attention to well-being. And then I'm going to talk just a bit about the future of work because some of the changes that are happening in the workplace that we often talk to clients about um, from the perspective of them improving their operations and their efficiency can have and will have implications for the well-being in all regards of people at work, the human in the digital workplace. What does that actually mean? What will be the impacts on mental health, resilience and well-being? And indeed, we don't know all the answers to those, but we can certainly see where some of those questions are emerging. And then just talk a little bit about some of the initiatives and the way we've approached it in Deloitte. Um, and as I say, we're on a journey, so we're only kind of getting to a point on a curve as we go. Um, if I just do, do a wee bit, I'll just say a bit about me, Liz, and then sure. if you do an introduction. Um, I should say, Christoph, thank you for, for your brief introduction on Deloitte. Um, indeed, for, for, for those of you who don't uh, know much about us, um, you're right, we're, we're upwards of a quarter of a million. It's probably approaching 300,000 um, people globally now. So a huge workforce facing into all of the challenges, issues, joys, and problems that that, that, that entails and clearly multicultural and doing lots and lots and lots and lots of different things. Um, and we'll come on to, to the journey we've been on with this, but, but clearly there's a huge diversity of experience with it within that workforce. Um, we're probably best known as being an audit firm globally, but indeed we do lots of things across the professional services agenda, consulting, which is where we both sit, and tax and corporate finance and all of those sorts of services as well. Um, I sit in our financial services practice and spend most of my time now doing big change projects with organisations in the city and globally, but I also have the roles, importantly, that Christoph alluded to, so I'm responsible for, across Europe, North and South Europe, uh, and including the UK, our approaches to physical, emotional, mental health and well-being in their various guises. And within the firm, I'm what we call a mental health champion, and we'll come on to talk a bit about that. And my personal interest in the topics and the journey that we're on um, has come through experience in the workplace, dealing with colleagues, having acute breakdowns, um, dealing with addiction, dealing with real issues that have caused them acute crisis. And from a place originally where it was very clear that the workplace had no idea how to respond in any substantive way whatsoever and sort of going on that journey with people so it's kind of a pastoral journey of helping people along the way as we've gone Liz so I'm a director in the health and life sciences strategy so I work with governments with NHS organizations with life science and industry organizations about how to get patients access to innovation and historically that's been very much around drugs or medical devices but along the way I've done lots of work in the mental health policy space so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second but particularly working with MIND and other organisations around that space and increasingly looking at digital health and how that can help fill in some of the early um, treatment gaps when people are waiting or there's a crisis situation etc so it's very much a whole health and life sciences perspective over the last 10 years and one of the things i should say before we start as well is we didn't really want to just 
present <laughs> some slides and, and we might have a conversation between ourselves. But equally, if you have questions as we go as we're going, just stick your hand up and ask. Um, there might be some points where we actually ask if anyone in the room's had experience of something we're talking about. But by all means, you know, do feel free to, to chip in and ask questions as we go rather than wait till the end because um, I think that will make it a bit livelier as well. And also if there are particular areas you're interested in because mm -hmm. I've spoken on this topic a number of times because of a piece of work that I've done. I know Kay's spoken a lot but it's never to this type of audience so in a sense we're not sure exactly what, you, what you're going to be interested in hearing from us. Perfect. So we thought we'd start with um, the journey and this is an incredibly simple picture. Um, what it's really talking about is the journey that we have probably been on ourselves, actually, in terms of this, this topic. And we both joined Deloitte about the same time, eight or so, so years ago, actually. Um, but also the journey that we have observed many of our clients and the organisations that we work with going on when it comes to this topic matter. And at the risk of kind of falling out of camera shot, I'm actually going to go and point at the screen <laughs> at this point. I'll probably use the, the pointy light, but anyway. It would probably be fair to say that if people had always been interested in mental health and well-being in the workplace, you'd have sort of seen a steady state increase in both the quality and focus on this. But that has not been the case. And certainly in our experience, until probably this, and that would be the same, this, this sort of very low level of interest could probably be any time from 1980 through to 2000 and eight, nine, ten actually, where there were only very, very, very few organisations paying any real heed to the issues of well-being and mental health in the workplace. And then there was a period between probably around about 2008 and 2013 where we started to see initiatives coming from the place of individuals in organisations who actually had a personal interest, perhaps because they'd had a um, an episode of depression and anxiety themselves because something had happened to a member of their family. So they'd come at it with a personal agenda and interest and had determined that on their watch something would be better for other people. And so a series of individualistic initiatives starting off, often not cross-organisational but very much driven by one person's impetus and motivation to make something change. And then here, which is kind of the point of inflection that we're at now, we're suddenly seeing, and this has probably been in the last two or three years, as recently as that, an absolute bow wave of interest corporately in making a difference to this. And when we come on to talk, when Liz talks about the business case, we'll start to see why that might be the case. But I think that here as well, on, the, on this journey upwards, we, we see probably five stages of people engaging in the journey. To, to begin with, this sort of reactive engagement with the journey. Um, people responding to, as I say, an initial situation or crisis or personal circumstance. Then a sort of an exploratory stage where people say, well, that's interesting. Actually, this does have wider relevance and l let's do something with that. And the extent to which they explore and develop that depends on funding in the organisation typically. Then perhaps it gets a bit more programmatic and you start to see organisation and corporate wide initiatives and processes and policies being developed. Um, interestingly, and Deloitte is a partnership, and I would say that as a partnership um, and a national partnership that has become a more global partnership, I think that there, is, that there, there have been more boundary issues to, to getting global policy and process in place than we've seen in some corporate organisations where you can drive through the global HR structures to make things happen. So I think we see some difference in different organisational constructs. And then sort of the more strategic or transformational approaches to mental health and well-being in the workplace, which people are only just starting to engage in now and will leverage the digital journey very much and the data journey. So we'll come on to talk about that. Liz, is there anything that you wanted to pick no, up I around that? No, I think that's that? perfect. So then this, we, we, we thought we'd just kind of, uh, on, on that thought, um, Play out, play out the Deloitte journey. Um, and I'll kick off, I'll just talk a bit about John Binns. We've referenced him at the beginning. And then Liz, if you talk about, because yeah, sure. you've been involved in some of these uh, activities and publications, and there's some other things to, to say on here. So Deloitte, absolutely classic to the model I described. We, and this would be true in my previous employer, which was, which was similar. Um, 
we probably didn't get going on the agenda until 2008 when uh, one of our colleagues, John Binns, who was quite a senior partner in consulting, had um, an acute depressive episode and was off work for about three months. And he came back to work and was fearful that he would be sacked, to be honest. Um, that's what he would say if you ask him. Um, and you, he's been interviewed on breakfast television and you can see him on YouTube. Um, his fear was the stigma of what had happened to him would mean that he would have been determined to be unfit for work and would be damaged goods and would be unable to return to his senior role. And actually the opposite happened. So uh, one of uh, the, the other leaders in the business said, actually, I don't think you realise, John, how prevalent this is, how many people this is impacting. And actually what we would love you to do is think about how we change the game here. How do we start to take away the stigma and make it okay to be dealing with mental health issues in the workplace? So John actually started by initiating our mental health champion uh, cohort, an idea which is um, providing support to our staff, and we'll come on to talk about that as a construct. But that's really where the journey started. Liz, do you want to pick up anything? Yeah, I'm very, I'm very happy. So I wasn't at Deloitte in 2008, and I know that in the early years where I was at Deloitte, I've been there for eight years since 2011, there was very little interest that I could see internally on this particular topic. And I think one of the key catalysts was our CEO signing the Time to Change pledge and all of the investment that went into that, and then us becoming a, par a, a, par a partner with Mind, the charity. And then we did a lot of projects back to back, thinking about how can we actually help them raise workplace well-being in the agenda. And I was involved in the, in the project that came up with the idea of the Workplace Wellbeing Index. And we started to think about what are the real challenges to getting it on the agenda at the, at the, at the C-suite level. And there were a number of different challenges there around the fact that there wasn't really an understanding of the business case. They didn't really understand exactly what the options for investment were. What we were seeing was very similar to what we saw in Deloitte, that if there was someone who was very senior that was championing this, it would get traction. But if there wasn't, it was very difficult to actually get this, to get any meaningful investment outside of the normal EAP programs, et cetera, that you would see. And so what we tried to do with the Workplace Wellbeing Index is actually harness some of those challenges and make them into positives. So by making corporates try and compete with each other to be able to move them up the, the ranking relative to each other, we were hoping that we would get more investment coming into workplace well-being more quickly. And the other thing that we were hoping to do with this was actually then give them more information about what they could actually do and what other organisations were doing. So in both close the knowledge gap in terms of what was possible, close the data gap in terms of giving people a benchmark of where they perform, and harness that natural competitiveness of organisations in order to try and get more millennials, etc., more of the talent that they want in through the door. And, and I was going to say, there's, there's a real irony in that, of course, because this is a topic where being competitive has the benefit of perhaps stimulating some, some, comp some naturally competitive competitor organisations to try and do more to be better than the other. But in truth, it's actually a topic matter where everyone should be trying to pull together to yeah. raise the bar for everybody. And there is no question that was that, that and it was, the psychology was spot on in terms of the organisations that we were probably trying to address with that thinking. But actually, and I have seen um, people talking about in different organisations, especially in, in, in the city perhaps, we have a better wellbeing programme than than competitor A or competitor B, which is which is great, but somehow misses the point. And 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 it's only in, in more recent years that when we're sort of coming to the end of that timeline, perhaps 2012, 13, 14, where we've started to see industry-wide organisations like the City Mental Health mm. Alliance, where you've actually started to see people with a more generosity of purpose and spirit coming together to share the thinking. I think in a more appropriate way. Yeah, so it was, it was designed to do both things, both make them competitive and make them share, and obviously that's I think somewhat the of a challenge. I think the sharing came later. <laughs> so, um, and then in 
November 2016, Deloitte did some This Is Me videos, which was people actually talking to camera about personal experience who break down the stigma. And I think that was, we we're quite well known for that, although we weren't the only organization doing that. I think that was quite um, an important moment. And then our relationship with Mind continued in terms of, I knew that we didn't really have that business case. So if someone wasn't emotionally tied into the investment, we needed to make the business case at the high level. And that's why I was really pleased to be asked to help with the Thriving at Work report to articulate what that business case was, because I knew that we really didn't have that data available. It needed to be a really simple message to get people to buy in. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, bringing it bang up to date um, in, in 2019, this is the point where, although we've had, in different parts of the business, programs focused on the wellbeing agenda, it's really only this year that we have got the umbrella over that that brings together all the parts of the business in, in a consistent way, and we're developing that. So if I think back to that curve, and, you know, I talked about it being reactive and exploratory and programmatic and strategic, I would say we're only just coming into the programmatic stage of that ourselves, uh, and we've probably been one of the forefront organisations in looking at it, which gives you a sense of how much there yet is to go, so very much work in progress. Yeah, slow. Do you want to drive yourself through the next bit? There we go. So we're just going to talk for a few minutes on the work that we did at th on Thriving at, at Work. And we were asked really three questions. The three questions was, what is the cost of mental health to employers? What is the ROI from mental health interventions? And what can we learn from international examples? And we were given about four or six weeks. ROI, sorry, it's return on investment. So if you put a pound in on what do you get in return, yeah. Apologies, this is going to be quite numbers heavy, so <laughs> I hope it's okay for, the, for and you guys. And do ask questions, yeah. please, hands yeah. up. So what we looked at is we looked at what, how can we break down and actually put into an easy to understand message what the cost to employers are. And what we found is that there's an absence cost, a presenteeism cost, and a turnover cost. And I think the absence cost is really quite well known and has been looked at by employers for a while, but they really struggle to understand any of the other um, costs to their business around um, poor mental health, resilience, or well-being of their staff. And are you saying that that's per annum, Liz? Or? That is per annum, yeah. so it's about 4% of GDP. And I think it's really important that we didn't get we didn't get really aggressive with our estimates and we got we were quite conservative for good reason because we didn't want to be challenged and we thought that the number was going to be stark enough without us being quite aggressive with the estimates so we took the low end of all of the assumptions that we could so the f that's the uk yeah it's only the uk yeah well, i can report. i can i can share the report i got a couple of hard copies and i can share the link so yeah. In fact, yeah. the report itself, which actually goes into all the detail, so either there's the hard copies or we can take people's details and, and email them out. Yeah. I've shared these slides many times, so I'm happy for them to, to go. So one of the first things we looked at was actually sickness absence, and you'll see that sickness absence has been going down overall. So I might stand up because there's quite a lot of data on here. So we see overall a trend around a declining in, in, in sickness absence. But what we do see is that the reported days lost to mental health are rising relative to a declining baseline. And I think this is indicative of two real things. One is that people are more likely to report that they've had that day off due to mental health, but also because we have an increasing prevalence of mental health problems um, within the UK as well. And that's the um, Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey, which is direct survey of, of people in terms of their symptoms on the bottom right-hand side. And so there we've got the absence cost, 8 billion, very substantial. But I think what's much more important and much more difficult to quantify is the impact of presenteeism. So this is someone coming to work but being unable to do their job at their best. And 
what we see is because of the change in um, working patterns, because of increased job, increased job insecurity, because of the fact that people are always on, less likely to report sick days, what we see is presenteeism is growing at a much more rapid rate than absence. And we think that presenteeism at is at least twice the cost to employers than absence. And we used some of the data that came out of the MIND Workplace Wellbeing Index, and we saw that about 40% of those surveys had, had um, a problem while at their current employer. So obviously there's a bit of a selection bias in there, but 40% of people said that they'd had a mental health problem while at their current employer. But what we saw, that only 40% of them had actually reported taking time off. So one and a half times the number of time people who've taken time off have actually not taken any time at all. And I think that really shows you how much of an issue presenteeism is. And we don't think of presenteeism as necessarily good or bad because some people want to, want to have a routine, they want to come to work, they don't want to take the time off. But obviously there are some big costs in terms of the way they work. So they might be less likely to take decisions, they might put off difficult tasks, they might you know, work slightly less hours, they might work slightly less efficiently, they might get on less well with their colleagues. So there are all sorts of different things that people report at these, at these situations and that's why we thought presenteeism is actually by far the largest cost to employers and then we have the turnover cost and this is the cost of losing someone either because they don't want to or can't maintain the current work that they have because of mental health they might have work-life balance issues etc and they leave and this is really another of those hidden costs that hasn't really been looked at historically very much and it's particularly high in an organization like Deloitte where it takes a really long time for someone to train to be the point where they're actually effective so if you're losing someone who's a really effective member of staff there's a massive cost actually to the organization of losing them and there's also a massive personal cost to that individual from the fact that they have to change jobs. So we actually looked at it by different sectors and I think people were really interested in this because um, it's known that say public sector there's more absence days overall but how does that actually combine into the costs per employee and if you think about the cost we've got about 1,100 uh, 1, to 1,500 pounds per employee in the private sector, and we've got 1,500 to 1,900 pounds per employee per year in the public sector. And these numbers are really, really high, and I think when you think about the size of investment that's going in organizations, you can see there's a real differential between the amount of money that's going in to keep people um, resilient and well and in good mental health relative to the amount that that's happening if they don't. And what we saw is that there's particularly some industries, so like finance, insurance, and retail is very um, high. Then we've got professional services, which is where Deloitte is, you know, near up to 2,000 um, pounds per employee. And then as you would expect, really, on the health sector as well is a really um, high cost um, per employee. So I think this was the first time that anyone had really broken down what the sectoral costs were and people were quite interested in this. What really differentiates them is how much it costs to really train up someone else. There are differentials in the number of absence days people take, the amount of presenteeism, but one of the big differences is how much, how, how, how um, negative is actually losing a good person within that and what's the cost of the, um, the business of doing that and I think that's why you see organizations like Deloitte in the banking sector in the legal sector up the curve in terms of in terms of paying attention to this because there's such a high cost and also because they need to they need to pay attention to get the new employees in in terms of the war for talent I don't know whether you've got any reflections on that Kay I think that that is, well, I think that's 100% correct. Um, and I think that the, the war for talent, in a way, is, 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 is quite a sad lens on it as well, because yeah. in, in some of those sectors, if, if we take financial services or professional services, um, there is a, 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 a let's call it, a, a competition yeah. for, for, for that highly trained, highly experienced talent. And because of um, 
the marketplace that they're in, they will engage in, in, in perhaps some of that. But actually, when, when you come to look at the public sector where there is this absolute desperate need for the support, um, it, it's, it's not quite the same. Yeah. Um, so in fact, I think it, it's in this space that some of the investment is, is as if not more needed sadly, but we're seeing it happen over here. I totally agree. And because a lot of my work is in the health sector, I was not surprised at all when I saw that health came up as the, the highest in the, in the public sector and the highest almost overall. So then one of the other questions was asked is, if that's the negative story, what's the good news story? And the good news story really was there. And what we found is that if you spend one pound in interventions, you get four pounds back. And I think that's really the good news story is because it actually then encourages organizations to think that they can do something about this and actually start the conversation about investing if that is something that they haven't done in the past. What we did for this is we looked at 130 different papers trying to find what the, co what the return on investment, so how much you, what you get back if you invest money, how effective interventions were, etc. And what we found is there was very little literature um, all of, sorry, a better way to say it, there was most of the literature we found actually had really, really strong positive impact of actually doing something. And um, what we found meant that it was the most positive numbers was where we actually used diagnostics or technology to access the people who weren't self-presenting. And so that might mean there was obviously a really good case around, you know, one-to-one -one interventions, all of those things. But where we found the highest intervent the highest returns was actually when we started to use technology to lower the barriers to access, or we started using a diagnostic to find someone who wasn't self-reporting. Sorry, Mr. Trump, could you say yeah. So there were, I, I can't remember all of the exact details, but the things like there were questionnaires sent out and then there were follow-ups around the questionnaires or people were given access to um, um, things like online um, self-help, etc., so that they actually were able to access some support but without putting their hand up That's to be amazing. able... Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I think that one of the areas that's really a large potential area for the workplace going forward is around digital interventions. Not when someone really needs support, but at the early level in order to raise awareness and to when there's a small incident where they can they can help themselves and they need additional tools to do that. But that's probably more on this next slide. At the absolute sort of cutting edge end of, of some of that, I was at a talk two weeks ago um, which was actually looking at some of the really cutting edge uses of AI around this space. And some of you will, will, will have seen um, the, the, the female sort of human robot, Sophia, who, who's, who's actually sort of been on various stages um, presenting and talking um, in, in quite an extraordinary way. And they did an experiment with her where um, some um, uh, computer programmers and uh, artificial intelligence specialists from the States ran a particular program with her where she was programmed to act as a counsellor and to her, to, because she has so many um, eff effective muscles in her face they actually programmed her to mirror and match people who were talking to her and to run a script and to see whether that was actually whether you could almost have this kind of robotic counsellor and whether that had any value to it to it or not you know so that people could just go and see someone without kind of talking about the fact that they were doing it um, and it was, a, it was the, 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 the filming of, of them actually trialling this was, was actually quite creepy, as well as being quite extraordinary, I must say. Um, but people responded, because, because she was actually mirroring and matching and giving almost human physical sim symbols, people actually responded and disclosed and actually came out and reported that they felt significantly better from the exercise. Uh, it was the most extraordinary thing. Um, and one, but one of the interesting little codicil comment, comments at the end of that, um, I'll try and find a link to that and we can share that as well if people are interested in it, um, uh, was that one of the problems they have in developing AI and ideas to do this is that it requires a more empathetic line of thinking to developing AI and there are very few female 
coders who were actually at the very cutting edge of doing AI. And, and, and this is a massive generic statement that they were making in the room, but because so many of, of, <laughs> of them are kind of slightly geeky men coding it because they can, rather than coding it with purpose and with intent for a good outcome. And so there was quite a philosophical conversation about the direction that could take. Well, I'm slightly taking a soft topic here, but I'll see if I can find that link to add to, to yours as well, Liz. So I think one of the other interesting, you've got a question? It depended on the study that was used. So what we tended to look for was a study that had a cost for putting the intervention into the organization plus a cost for the employee time, and then looked over a period to see what the impact of that intervention was, was on either the organization as a whole or of the individuals that took. And if, you, if you're interested, some of the details are in the back of the report. But we tried to be quite consistent. The real challenge was there was very, very few studies that really looked in this space. And we did this research about 18, 20 months ago. And I really hope that there's been quite a lot more research done on this, this area since. And one of the things that I'm hoping to do over the next year is actually with them um, uh, a mental health platform has actually run some of these studies to understand what the real impact is with big employers because I think that's really one of the big challenges that we still have is like what really works and I think this was great 18 months ago to encourage organizations to invest more money but I think there's still a lot more that could be investigated in this area and I hope people are, are doing more now so this is what we tried to do is pull everything together into one visual that could really be just used in isolation and encourage organizations to invest at the right period. And what we, what we thought about it was in terms of a journey. And here you have an employee, you know, they're in good mental health. If you invest at this period, invest in their awareness, their resilience, spotting signs in themselves, etc., working efficiently with colleagues. This has the best return on investment. So if you're this is the best place for an organization to invest in terms of pounds returned. Then an employee has a health, a life or a work event and they start to become less thriving, not quite struggling, but starting to have some some difficulties. And here if you can actually find the people at this early stage, what we found here is that you still get a really good return on investment. And it's at this point that an employee either has to start taking time off work or is working, um, but not at their best. And then here, this is where employees have really historically invested. It's when it's really obvious that an employee needs help. And this, although we still have a really good return from investment here, this has been historically where employees have put all of the money. And this is a good return, but less good than if they do it all the way across. So what we've tried to do with this paper is to really encourage those employees who are just thinking at this end to start thinking about raising the amount of money that they spend earlier on in the journey. And it was the design of this was just to make a really, really simple message that most people could understand. And I'm really happy to report I know that it has worked in that it was a really simple articulation of what many people in the profession knew already, that if you, you invest earlier, you, you get a better return. And I'd say in our personal experience, uh, if you relate that to the journey that, that we've been on, it was unquestionably the case that we as Deloitte started off only doing the reactive. In an acute situation, we would put our hands up and, and help somebody who was, was, was actually presenting themselves as, as needing help. Um, and actually, a lot of our effort is now way back here doing education and support from the point that people join the organisation onwards and we'll talk a little bit about that so we've sort of tried to move the dial back to there and I think that we still know despite that that in organizations like ours where people um, are often perfectionists um, we have a lot of people on the neurodiverse spectrum um, which I'll talk a bit about more as we go through but people who might not put their hands up and, and, and self-declare that they are facing an issue um, equally that colleagues might not spot because they're so intent on presenting the last place they're going to fail is in the workplace 
that actually the point at which they really get in trouble, they're way beyond the point at which many people might otherwise have said they needed some help and support. So we almost have to be doubly attentive because people will will go out of their way to hide the challenges that they're facing in order to still appear as if they're performing in the workplace. Where do, where do currently APs sit on that spectrum? Where, where the bulk, employee... Yeah, the Kay's going to talk about that later, but I think depending on the individual, it could be in either of these yeah. spaces. I'll give you a bit of a view about how ours is used as well and, and some of the stats. So I thought it was worth just touching on some of the things that, that we tend to be talking to organisations to around the future of work, because we, we have these conversations inevitably all of the time now because so much is changing and in the nature of it it is about how organizations can leverage data and technology and new opportunity to recreate themselves uh, and, and, and be new organizations but be more effective but actually there is also a social and a human component to this which um, has not as yet had enough attention, and I think that some of the challenges and issues are yet to, to arise, and I'll be interested if people in the, in the room have a perspective on some of this as well. So we talk about there being seven kind of main areas of, of disruption that are impacting the workplace, and that's not just ours, but, but everyone's at the moment. So, and, and, and they're all fairly self-evident, but to give them a, just a, a quick run around, Technology is everywhere. Um, every single one of us in the room has got um, the smartphones and people are taking photos, but whatever it is, two point two and a half billion smartphones and rising, there's nowhere to escape technology. Um, the internet of everything is, 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 is starting to encroach as well. More data than ever. I think the last two years, there's been nine times more data than has ever been produced in the whole of the rest of the history of, of mankind. So data is everywhere, albeit not very much of it is actually being used for, for good purpose. Um, and, and I think on this topic, there's a lot more that could be done with some of the data that's available. Um, Diversity and generational change, this is an interesting one. So we know, and in, in our workplace, we now probably have five generations of people in, in the workplace. So you're having to deal with an enormously wide spectrum of experience, maturity, interest, and actually um, the, the propensity to have different experiences of well-being, mental health, and resilience, completely different across that spectrum. Um, and that is presenting massive change, uh, challenges uh, in, in terms of how we respond to some of these things. From our perspective, um, what we see is the general, and we recruit um, as apprentices, so school leavers 16 onwards into the workplace. Um, and we've certainly got people in their 60s. So we really have got, got that span. And we know certainly at that more youthful end of the spectrum, and we're starting to spend a lot of time looking at the issues around teenage mental health and well-being um, because we're being presented with people, colleagues, who are dealing with a whole new range of issues that we've actually never had to wrestle with um, in the workplace. And that's another of the reasons, and I said at the beginning, I think there's a two-way conversation with this community, for example, for us, because we are, and, and oh, I'll make it personal, so as, as an older leader in the business, I am incredibly ill-equipped to know what a 17 year old uh, young woman who wants to self harm in, in the toilets at work uh, is, is feeling and thinking and what kind of support they need. Um, there's a whole range of new issues being presented. We're seeing arise uh, in the workplace. We know from, from <coughs> anecdotal, <coughs> but, but some more um, formal feedback that we are dealing with a rise in, in eating disorders, in self harm. Um, We've always, um, in the city, there's always been, alcohol has, has often been the drug of choice, but we're seeing a much greater range of use of um, new, newer, newer drugs that we wouldn't even perhaps know how to recognize um, <laughs> in terms of, of, of the presenting symptoms. So this generational diversity is, is a real problem for us. Liz, do we need to get you some water? <laughs> It's almost a Theresa May moment. I don't know how to say it, but. Oh, it's me throwing my speaking. I didn't do it. I know, thank you. 
Um, so that as, as an area of development is of, of increasing interest to us and, and, and new challenges and questions that we have to address. The change in, in the nature of careers. So again, you know, it, it's now said that, that people will, in five years' time, people will be doing jobs that aren't invented today. So how on earth we keep people interested and trained in order to be fit for purpose for the workplace as we move forward is an enormous challenge. And that links in to these, these last three points really, really easily. So the explosion in contingent work, and by that I kind of mean what people refer to kind of coarsely as, as the gig economy, but, but, in, but, but this has exploded. And Uber's an obvious example, but, but it's all over the place. So people on zero hours contracts with no holiday entitlement, with no sick entitlement, with no benefits in, in the workplace, with an uncertainty of work, who are probably underemployed in any one uh, job that they have. Um, all of those features bring stresses to bear which people are more or less resilient to, and those will be, will, those will be rippling through the workforce. Um, jobs vulnerable to automation. Uh, it's estimated that in the UK, uh, probably um, in the next 10 to 20 years, 35% of jobs will be vulnerable to automation. So the opportunity there in different sectors for a significant number of people to be out of the job they're now in, albeit that technology often brings, I think we've seen new job opportunities, but when you think about the training and development needed for those, again, a, a, a cohort of individuals who will be facing all sorts of stresses about how they can fit into the workplace and is there gainful employment for them. Um, and then everything linked to that, auto, um, artificial intelligence and robotics. Um, and cognitive computing, which are also changing the face of the workforce. So all of these taken together bring a huge range of new challenges to bear in the workforce. And as I say, the race has been to think about the benefits and opportunities to leverage and exploit these, but what do they mean for the mental health and well-being of people who are in the workplace? And, and we're really just starting to face into those um, and it will be very interesting to see how those start to evolve, but we've got to be very mindful about the challenges as they go. Liz, is there anything you've seen from other sectors apart from ours that sort of starts to speak to this? No, um, you, you go, so one of the elements that we were looking at when we were doing the Stevenson Palmer work is trying to understand what the impact was around these types of the particularly around the contingent workforce, but it was just really, really difficult to start to unpick, unpick that element, especially given when you look at the generational differences in application and who, which age groups are actually more involved in contingent working, etc. So we actually just put it in the too difficult bucket, but it's clearly something that really needs to be looked at. And then we do know, because the, the, the nature of, of work will change in this situation, that some of the, the skills and capabilities will be more important in the future. And these are, are the more empathetic skills often, the more judgmental skills, the more insightful, um, bringing to bear your experience and view, being able to listen and reason. And really importantly, um, people's ability to engage with each other, so the more human side um, of working with each other will actually have to come into play more to balance out some of the things that we've talked about. Again, that's something that we're only just starting to explore. And this is really important, because if you come back to all the points we've just made, the change and support that people get in the workplace around mental health and well-being and resilience, and in fact, all, all of the aspects that we're talking about, are most usually only effective if they're driven by and understood by the leaders in whatever organisation or business you're, you're talking about. And actually, the leaders, when you think about that point around generational change, some of the new technologies and challenges that we're facing into, very often the leaders of businesses are going to be the least well-equipped people to understand the challenge that they're facing into, the challenges that their colleagues and workforce are facing into, and actually made themselves be absolutely terrified by the changes they see around them, may never have felt less able to manage their organisation through the challenges they're being faced with. So I think we, we, we start to see a crisis of conscience around, and confidence, it, it would be fair to say, uh, in some more self-aware leaders about, do they actually have the skills, capabilities and competency to lead 
people as people through the changes that we're now facing into. Um, and, and, and that's something that will require real, real focus. So we just wanted to then talk a little bit about some of the work that we've done in Deloitte. Before I get on to that, are there any questions on any of the, of, of the, the, the points that we've sort of raised so far, either the detail around the, the, the business case or some of those, those higher level points? Great question. See, that, so it is genuinely a really, really great question. So when we recruit into Deloitte, um, people come in through, through, through several routes. As graduates, um, they do come in through online CV screening. The first point of call is online CV screening, blind screening, so, so that it is blind from a, a gender and diversity perspective, if you see what I mean. So we'll see people's capabilities and experience. We won't see the who they are. Um, uh, and they will, against our criteria, so we get CVs. They do, everyone gets interviewed, so people have a, there's a human I I interview. More experienced um, hires will be, obviously, go through a full one-to-one -one interview and, and panel process as, as they go. Um, do we know when people come into the business what challenges they might have had are presenting in terms of anything around their mental health experience, only if they choose to declare it. Um, and obviously people can and do. If, if A great example actually probably that we see the most self-declaration around when people join is dyslexia actually. So lots, and we, and we have a lot of dyslexic colleagues and people will actually self-declare that because that means they get help, support, um, and protection actually in, in, in the workplace. So, so we encourage people to declare any, um, any experience they've had, and it's by no, uh, that in itself is not a barrier at all to, to recruitment. I don't know if that actually answers the question, though. What, what were you trying to get to with that? Um, well, I, I don't know, really. I think <laughs> actually it might be quite illegal to actually probe too deeply. No, you, people have to self-declare. Uh, you, you can't be going out and trying to, to find things out. <coughs> We can have a port. We can have an AV pause if, if we need. No, we're good. We're good. <laughs> I didn't want to do a Mm-hmm. So psychometric testing. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we see psychometric tests applied pre-appointment at senior, senior levels. Um, once people join in Deloitte, we, we do a lot of work around, we would call it business chemistry, but what are people's behavioral preferences and how might people work together. That wouldn't pick up issues around mental health or being that's really around behavioural preferences in, in the workplace. I would say the main way that we screen is by actually giving them job tasks, so <laughs> you know, workshops and things like that, and actually see how they perform actually on the job in, you know, group settings and things like that. That's the main the main screening after the initial filter. Mm. Uh, Again, it, th they are at senior levels. I think that's more to do with, with the fear of the older employees kind of having a heart condition or, you know, so, so there's a medical insurance len lens on that, uh, but it's, it doesn't run through the whole, the whole organisation. I just know of cases where in some pre-employment drug testing was done. Yes. Yeah, you kind of hope that people would think about that. Yeah. 
Ab absolutely. So, so that's again, it's one of the reasons why we're really keen to kind of be coming and, and engaging with, with ICAD and so on. If you think about, so Deloitte is a huge professional services firm. Um, I work almost exclusively in, in financial services. So as a sector, the city of London um, would be no surprise if I said to people, has long been thought to have a sort of a, a, a very male-oriented drinking culture. And this presents problems to, to this point in the workplace because to what extent um, are all social events structured around going to the pub for a drink? Um, if you don't go to the, to the pub for a drink because you, you're a teetotaler, or you, that's just not the place where you particularly feel comfortable, it doesn't really float your boat, that's something you want to do. Is that in some way impeding your progress around being in with the right people to, to be able to get on and, and support your career? So there are topics here which also stray well into diversity and, and all of these other, other topics. We have, it, it, it's, I would say there is evidence to suggest that that the drinking culture in the city has probably for decades masked a number of people being functional alcoholics in the workplace. Um, because it's very easy to, to drink every day if you want to under the guise of work. Um, and because people have a tendency to willful blindness, people won't actually call it out even when they think it's a problem as opposed to just social drinking. And I've certainly seen I've personally seen instances in my professional career where people who had very significant alcohol issues, um, hospitalizable levels of alcoholism, um, were actually just laughed off as being, oh, he drinks, he has, he's had a bit too much to drink. The fact that so-and-so was actually collapsed in a heap at the bottom of the stairs. Oh, he just had one too many tonight, but he'll be all right in the morning. And people would just kind of be bystanders and, and, and let it go. I think that culture has moved on. Um, uh, and, and I mean, certainly we are very, we would be and are active for ourselves in, in trying to, to move that on. In some ways, alcohol, is the is the easiest of if I'm going to say sort of addictive areas for us to deal with in, in the workplace because because of that level of the commonplace na nature of it it's the one where people feel the least shame to perhaps put their hand up and say I've got a bit, bit of a problem the minute we stray out of that we get into into real people won't disclose and they won't talk about issues with um, actually even I mean e even problems with addiction to um, social media or you know screen addiction let alone drugs obviously because of the problems that that would cause in terms of you, well, you might be sacked if you put are you going to be sacked are you going to be supported who knows what what will happen so people are one ashamed and two fearful to put their hands up um, and then anything beyond that in terms of addictions sex and love addiction porn addiction no I have yet to see a single person put their hand up visibly in the workplace, certainly, to, to my knowledge, and say, in, in the stats that I've got around our calls to the employee advice line, um, addiction features, but it's a really small percentage of the calls, and I don't, my suspicion is it's, it's grossly underreported even in that confidential um, environment. So it presents a huge problem for us because um, people won't say, we're unable to provide support, but probably desperately ill-equipped to do it as well because we, we're, we're not the experts in the field either. So we would need, you know, we need to be able to have, have, have ways of referring people in the right way. Because actually, and, and it, I don't have, I mean, I couldn't give you a business case and tell you it would equate to the numbers that, that Liz presented there. But what we do know is that if you can intervene, you can actually, and, and you have a reasonable chance because work will have the, the resources and the constructs to put around it, that we can actually give enough support and help for people to get on a path to recovery if they want to. But again, it comes back to that, do, do they want to? Because I, I have seen it go both ways. I've seen people fall out of the workplace and actually die of alcoholism. But I've seen equally people um, be caught given support um, 
and I can, you know, I can think of an example of um, even a personal example, not in our firm, um, but somebody who was literally, you know, sui suicidal, and, and actually there was a huge, there was about to be a huge human cost, and actually they've come back and been promoted in a, another firm to partnership, and have been clean for, for years and years and years. So I, I think there is you, there is a business case, whether you say it's a monetary one or a or a human one, that we could demonstrate. But it's going to be it would also be much harder to get to. But equally, just on that human point, I think that we would say that we almost have a in, in our role as leaders, we have a moral responsibility to provide stewardship and pastoral care and support in whatever form that takes to all of the people to whom we have that a, a duty of care so all of our employees are entitled to ask for the support they need regardless of in a non-judgmental way regardless of the issue that they're presenting our bigger challenge would be would people put their hand up to ask for help but i i also think that and similarly with the, the business case earlier about raising the awareness in very simple stats of how impactful it is and the simple things that businesses can do to make some slight cultural shifts within their organisation and make it as, as, le as least scary as possible mm. for them to start on that journey. I would disagree with that, that a little bit, actually. Yeah, I would say that universities, in my experience, seem to be a little bit behind where progressive employers are, and I see quite a lot of nods in the audience. So I, I, I haven't done as much work with universities and school sectors as I has, have done with employers, but when I have had conversations, I've had hundreds of conversations with employers, I've maybe had 10 conversations with people in the schools and the university sector, but I found that their attitudes are probably a lot further back than I expected that they would be and actually the level of data that they have on their student population and what the real challenges that they're facing are is woefully inadequate for the real service provision that they need. Sometimes what I've seen yeah. is some of the services are there, the nature of university life, they're just not accessible. Mm. That's, and that's actually a, a great point. Oh, yes. I was going to say on our employee advice line, even though we would say it's advertised all over the place on our intranet, that you would see it everywhere, I am constantly astonished by the fact that when people come to actually talk about n n presenting with things that that would be the first point of call for, people simply aren't even aware it's there. So level of awareness for all sorts of things is a real challenge. I'm sorry. Exactly. Yes. So what experience, I mean, I'm, I work in the creative sector, mm -hmm. and other industries where I'm afraid what you're saying is fantastic. I wish the creative community could have a low, the R&A coming from mm. a bigger company, but there's just some kind of yeah. vision, there's nothing. I mean, do you have experience? I would, I, I would agree with you, it is further back. I, yeah. I think there are some, I've, I've had some conversations with em with employers in that sector, and I would agree that there hasn't been the drive to do it. I think it is changing, and I was speak I was speaking last week with someone who the one of the large creative a few large creative organisations were starting to think about some behavioural kind of nudge stuff with their employees, etc. So I think it is changing, but they're further back than mm. than the professional services firm definitely.
So, so let me talk a little bit about, and again, I'm talking about our firm and, and our experience um, broadly around this. It would be a general truth, though, to say that the more we have started to explore it, the more people are, are reporting. So, so there is a bit of a chicken and an egg in, in the what we, we start to look at here. So have these problems always been here? Is it that the more we're asking, the, the more we're surfacing them? Um, is it that actually things are becoming more challenging and there are more pe people are experiencing greater levels of stress and anxiety and men mental health? And there's probably elements of, of both in truth. Um, and certainly to that point about the, the generational issues, um, we are seeing significant numbers of our 25 to 35 year olds um, saying that they are suffering from burnout type problems. Um, I would say sort of 15 to 20% are reporting in any one year that they're feeling some level of kind of burnout experience. Much, and so as a, as a demographic group, that's much higher than, than the rest of the business as well. But we are experiencing, and this, this actually I think is a mix of, of our statistics and, and some more general ones to be fair actually. Um, but I think it just plays back, Liz, to everything you've said about the degree of anxiety um, and mental health concern that people are experiencing. Um, so actually a huge number reporting that they have had some kind of experience. Um, there's a reluctance to disclose uh, is clearly one of the themes. Um, and that the presenteeism is, is an important point because where people have a physical illness, they will stay at home and get better. But where they have a non-visible um, mental concern, they will show up and just be less than productive in the workplace. And it has that ripple effect because one person who's less than par in that sort of energetic sense will bring the vibe of, of everyone down. So it is a bit contagious. So presenteeism has, I think, emotional and energetic costs as well as just some of those more visible um, the more visible revenue-based yeah. ones. Totally. I think that's what we're trying to normalise, but it takes a really long time to open people up to be able to feel that they can have that conversation and also give them the comfort level to know that they can signpost on if someone actually says, no, I'm not okay. And I think that's a large part of what, what Deloitte's journey has been about and what Kay's going to talk a little bit more about, how we've been trying to open that up to be able to have those conversations. Yeah, and, and, and so there's been a number of, because it, it's a really good point. I mean, there's, there's, there's good old-fashioned British reticence, and then there's just uncomfortableness <laughs> and embarrassment and, and, and people not being comfortable to inquire personally when, when people seem to be not quite themselves. Is it intrusive? And, and, and so on. And actually, um, that's all part of the stigma of, of it. And, and, and actually, is it better to say something rather than, again, just ignore and, and be a passerby? Through the original Mental Health Champion initiative that we took, but more recently through uh, engaging around the um, mental health first aid courses, we've been trying to put huge numbers. We've been aspiring to get 25% of all staff through mental health first aid courses. And part of the curriculum in those is to get people people role play through in this situation if you saw this person how how could you talk to them about it how would you broach the conversation um, what are the things that you should really be alert to because actually it might be more serious than you think and you, you might be the one opportunity to catch something before it becomes really serious so have the courage of speaking out and asking and showing um, what I always think is is actually really, in, in some ways, paying attention to colleagues and friends' um, mental health is actually much more simple than, than we make out with all of the frameworks and, and training that we put around it. Because if you actually show interest and warmth and care and compassion for people kind of on a human level and just extend those 
emotional attributes in the way you engage with people, you would go a long way to being able to simply overcome some of some of that those those barriers. But we're but 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 those emotional attributes perhaps are perhaps a bit too scarce in, in the workplace. But I think at some level it's as simple as that. That would go a very long way. It's not as simple as that, but that in itself would, yeah. would go a long way. Um, just because it, that's an, that was a first pass achievable, <laughs> that's what we could get to with the money we had and the, and the, the, the scale of the organisation that, that we've got available to face into with it, which is huge, right? So, um, And it is ideal to, cha to train everyone, but if there are enough people around you that are able to have that conversation and start to change the dialogue, then you do start to change the culture. So it's getting to the point where there are enough people who are engaged within the organisation, great point no I think I think you're right and that's why I mentioned the point about signposting because I don't think we're training people up to to replace we're no. training people up to pass on when it's necessary and I agree with you I think one of the challenges that Kay and I were talking when we we're coming over here is that we've just recently moved into a new office and it's a really nice new office but actually some of the, the pros of that office for most of the population are actually downsides for others in the way that we can use that space and I think that we need to be more considerate about how different people need to use that space, quieter areas, etc. And like you say, spa contemplation spaces, etc. for people, so that we actually are able to provide more of a well-being environment within the office itself. Mm. And I think we've gone somewhere that with our new building, but actually we could be doing more. Mm. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, no, I, I agree, and, and, and I mean, this is always our concern, is that we can be interested at, we can be interested amateurs in, in the sense of the, but, but we can never be the professionals in providing some of this care. So what we need to have is enough people who understand what the portals for people to access and what the range of those portals can be and how people can, can, can get to them quickly can be. And interestingly, actually, uh, so, on the, right at the beginning of the presentation, uh, I referenced John Binns, who was sort of one of the founding fathers, if you like, of our own program with, within Deloitte. And since he retired from the firm in 2013, he actually now works. So he used to be obviously a mental health champion, so people would would access him and talk to him within the office space. And he's now gone on um, to to qualify um, as a counsellor and actually operates independently in an office space that sort of is adjunct to, to one of our offices. And what's interesting is he's gone from being seen, and he was always accessed quite a lot, but he might have seen three or four people a week would sort of put their hand up and go and talk to him when he was a partner in the business. And now he's working as an independent counsellor in his own space. His diary is literally full every single day of the week. So I think it speaks exactly, that's only one small little anecdote but I think it speaks exactly to what to what you're saying. Absolutely. Thank you. 
you been seeing well, some of that with the digital? I think well, what I mean one of the, one of the areas I think is lowering the barrier to access through online. I agree with with being able to have easy access, be it on the high street or within your organisation. I think it's just a much lower barrier, and people willing to present at a much earlier stage. So I agree with you, and I think technology certainly for some of the areas that I work in can have a real beneficial effect in terms of opening up access to the types of people that wouldn't necessarily go through traditional routes. But I think we're on a very start of that journey. Mm. And unfortunately, a lot of the organizations that are involved in that are not developing the evidence base in a way that would be robust enough to really meet the criteria of like a randomized controlled trial or similar. And I think as the digital health progresses along the journey, I think we're going to see much more rapid iteration of the way that the results come through. So we're going to see much shorter periods in which we're going to be able to see whether something works or not. And I, th I think it absolutely speak, speaks, I mean, if you, if you look at this, you know, <coughs> even where people are disclosing, the extent to which they might feel that they get proper support um, is, is very variable. So I, th I think there's a natural progression there, and it's a question of how quickly yeah. it moves there. Um, Mm -hmm. are coming in and say horribly my grandchildren are going to end up being just um, and being carried all the way up to the secondary school I can't speak for our level but I suspect that they're pretty young but I think when they the, that cohort hit the workforce it will be the norm mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know that yeah. uh, and certainly much easier for a 10 year old now to talk about living yep <coughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, just Interesting. I think there's also a differential expectation of how they access care in that usual in that younger age group mm. as well, which is where the digital piece actually yeah, lowers sure. the barriers yeah. too. So, yeah, agreed. And I think I was just, there were two points. We can, so the work we, do, we do work with a, 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 an organisation called St Mary Magdalene Academy. Um, and, I, and one of the things we do is actually support them in doing some resilience, mental health and wellbeing programmes. So it's absolutely getting, getting I think, bedded in there. And I know Christoph's just, le just left the room, but ICAD did an extraordinary um, pro programme or, or an event called Courageous Conversations. Uh, with the school where they actually took over the school the headmaster invited them in and they ran a day where the whole of the school participated in a series of conversations for age for, for class groups for teachers and parents separately and they talked about um, anxiety depression gender identity eating disorders self-harming um, a whole range of issues that that might be facing the, the pupils in a confidential classroom environment with none of their parents or teachers there, but ran parallel sessions for the, the, the adults and then had more broad conversations bringing people together at the end. So seeing uh, initiatives like that is, is really very powerful actually, I think. So this is, um, this is, this is as much disclosure as you ever get out of our employee um, ad <laughs> advice line. So it, it remains no entirely confidential uh, in terms of the individuals. And the latest data that, that we made are able to get is 2017, so it's not, not the last year either. But this just actually speaking to the things we've been talking about, what, 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 what are we seeing in, in the workplace? Um, the preponderance of presenting reported issues 
are, uh, are mental health related, whether that be anxiety, depression, uh, low mood, or the impact of the mental health of, of others. So that is the, the primary reporting um, cause uh, that, that we see. Work-related stress can be any number of things, and actually what I say there is um, people feel stress around year-end reporting processes, and often it's a balance as well of physical, mental, and emotional issues which they are then experiencing challenges in the workplace because of them. I can't tell you what service inquiry relates to, <laughs> um, but, but, but the other things you would expect to be in there. Bereavement um, is in there, uh, so bereavement, grief, um, and relationship problems, which is, which is the partner point. And then a whole range of, 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 of other issues as well in there. And as you say, I reference addiction, a, a relatively small number of people re reporting un under that, perhaps unsurprisingly. Um, but that speaks exactly to everything we've said about the kind of issues we're seeing arising and the kind of services that we're trying to present. Um, and I don't know how that relates to anyone else's, obviously, but that's a snapshot of one of ours. Um, and we, 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 you know, we, we constantly challenge ourselves around, is this, is this too much? Is it too little? Why is this too many people reporting? Is it that actually you don't get what you don't measure and so on? Are we being given 10 minutes? We're being given 10 minutes. I think what's also interesting oh, is we have about 26% of employees call in every year, which is way above other organizations kind of average. Um, and I think that's because we have communicated well around the services available and it's one of those things that we do promote. There are still issues about confidentiality, but I know that some organizations have really, really low usage of their mm -hmm. EAP, so we're towards the top end. Um, this just very briefly then is, it, these are the dimensions that we, we look at when we're looking at workplace health and well-being, um, mind, body, purpose and workplace. Workplace, some, some interesting things about that. Um, Liz, you touched on the, physic, the physical location. So actually, especially where we have, and as, as we've said, quite a lot of colleagues on the neurodiverse spectrum, um, we employ a lot of people at high-end maths and analytical skills, and we get a disproportionate number somewhere on, on the spectrum, bit, partly because of that. And in terms of workplace, they need certainty, they need quiet, they need to know who they're sat next to from day to day, they need a static and safe environment to work in that they, they can feel comfortable in. And this is challenged unwittingly by actually the move to more energetic, free-flowing, open plan spaces where people are hot dis desking, moving around, having loud conversations around them all the time, where they can't have a, a static desk. And, and, and there are some unintended consequences, I think, of some of the, the moves in, in the current flavors and themes in sort of directionally around workplace design. And, and some of these requirements need to be thought about mindfully and built in, because otherwise you disenfranchise uh, a segment of, of, your, of your colleague base un unintentionally. For us, hours worked isn't a key goal, which might be different from, I don't know, the, the legal end of professional services yeah. might be our hours worked is sort of billable hours, so you're sort of, you know there's that, that work-life uh, dimension. We don't work on that, as well, certainly not in the, in the consulting firm on that basis. We, we're doing projects where we have outputs and deliverables to achieve, the how you get there the number of hours you, you work, you can flex the team to do it. It's not an hours game, it's, it's much more of a team construct to do it. So we We're trying to have much more of an output focus rather than an hours focus. I think there are some still individuals still that do have more of an hours focus, but the general culture, I would say, yeah. is more output focused. We don't. It, we can't really incentivise per, per se, um, and we haven't needed to. People have been incredibly enthusiastic. In fact, to the more we offer, in fact, we don't seem to be offer. We haven't reached. We never reached the end of what we can offer for people to want to participate in. And our only barrier is time and resources, human and financial, to actually get behind the, the programmes. There's no. 
lack of enthusiasm to get behind them. And I'll come on to some of the stats at the end, actually, about the number of people participating in things. I think demand outstrips supply, and we're rapidly trying to keep up with yeah, the demand. Yeah, no, super. super. Um, and, and this very, very briefly, I'm very conscious of the time, very briefly, the areas that, that sort of the six areas that probably we, we do work in in any of our, in, in, in our program across the, the, the wide organisation uh, and then in pockets within the organisation. Um, so we, in no particular order, do run campaigns. We have that on our intranet. We have them on live screens through our buildings. We will have them on people's uh, screensavers. So we will tell people what, what's going on and where they can access things. Um, we try to make use of all sorts of wellbeing tools and topics and do it in partnership with other organisations where we can to give access to um, free gym, access across the country and things like that. Um, making sure that it is, and this actually for me is, is incredibly important, that the leadership of the organisation is standing four square behind all of the initiatives because if they don't, then there will be no traction to anything that gets done. So that is absolutely fundamental and having things like our CEO signing up to, to the pledges, um, incredibly important. Having people in the business who are champions, whether that's visibly because they've got a title like a mental health champion or just because they behave in a way which is compassionate and understanding and warm towards other people. Um, and providing training and support, which we do to all of these roles in order to equip them to deliver. Education and engagement, so try to take things back to the start, Liz, of, of your curve of investment. We now have um, courses which we run from graduate level um, onwards at each uh, promotion point where we try to talk to people about, try to, we talk to them whether that much goes in, I suppose is the question, around all aspects of physical, mental health and well-being. So that covers, and all the obvi obvious components, sleep, nutrition, hydration. Alcohol. Alcohol is, is, is in there as well. Um, but keeping people informed so that they can self-manage themselves because that's, that's the best way to actually make this, um, make this effective. And actually we do try to uh, take surveys and understand what feedback we're getting. That, that's actually the area where, from a data perspective, we think we can start to do a lot more so long as we can access and start to correlate against various of our systems and we can on a GDPR and a privacy basis. But so those are the six areas that we tend to work uh, around in all of the things that we do. That's our credo, if, if you like. Um, and there's a sense of purpose around that because we are thinking very much about the impact, that, the ripple impact that we have. You know, nearly 300,000 people touching myriad, millions of people on a daily and weekly basis. The impact that our people can have is enormous. So if they are well and thriving and energetic, then they're, 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 as a force for good it is, is huge and, and the converse is true so that, that is very important uh, to us and just um, finishing very briefly to give you a sense and this is 2019 to date in our consulting business so a snapshot of some of the things that, that go on um, with some of the honest sort of feedback that we get as, as well around things so from our activities we have reached we've delivered 21 courses this year Milestone programs are where we've got people being promoted at different grade points, um, and we've, we've managed to cover about 1,500 staff doing that. Um, we're always handing out books to people, uh, and we talk to publishers to get books around the wellbeing agenda that we can then just distribute to people. Um, we run events, um, things that we call live cafes, where we have panels that we stream, live stream through the business, where we talk on subjects like teenage mental health or trauma we've done. Um, grief, bereavement, um, death, grief, bereavement, and beyond, where we talked actually even about near-death experiences, which was which was quite it was stretching the envelope, it, but we've got great feedback. We've dealt with the menopause, which is an under-reported and under-discussed topic, which is of increasing importance in a diverse uh, and aging female uh, workforce. So we're doing more around that. So lots of kind of conversations and discussion points that we host. Um, talking to lots of clients and, and as we've said, in, and indeed competitors about what's going on in order to try and raise the bar generally. Um, and we do find that the more discussions we have, the more it will create opportunities where people will put their hand up and say, I wouldn't have said, but now I can, now you've talked about that, I'm going to declare this, can you help? Um, and what kind of feedback do we get? Broadly speaking, people um, want more. We have a challenge in our organisation about being London-centric and how do we cover all of our regional offices and non-London 
premises, uh, and that remains a challenge, and we need to do more. Um, and what else do people say? Uh, that there's more to do. And, and to the point somebody here was, you were making about hours charged. Um, working practices are still at odds with wellness principles, working through lunch, long hours, and after work drinking. So exactly some of those points that we've talked about that some people are still observe. Uh, so there's an, you never get really to, to the end of this. Um, it's a journey, and, and we're, we've started it. I would say we are, we've made some headway. The, the more headway we make, the more we realize there is to do. I think that's probably true for all organizations embarking on this agenda. Um, I'm really happy to talk to anyone about their observations and thoughts uh, beyond this conversation as well. And uh, as we've said, do give us your details if you want uh, the, the report as well uh, afterwards. Liz, anything else from no, you? No, that's great. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I was wondering whether you know if there's any legislation changes on the horizon that's going to compel uh, employers to uh, offer this package to the workers to do it. Well, I think with the, I haven't seen anything recently, mm -hmm. I don't. Um, but the Thriving at Work had the core and then the, the advanced, and that was around increasing the amount of investment in those particular areas but it was very much a voluntary mm -hmm. code as you probably know so I think that it was going to be much more along moving along the voluntary code until you get to a particular point where employers are doing it I don't know of any any legislation that will require employees to do it. and I think I would imagine it'd be a little way away if that was if that was the plan no I haven't heard any mm. thank you very much Thank you.